Well, welcome to the third of our lectures on conversations of cultural fluency. Today we're going to talk about Haudenosaunee agriculture and what can we learn from the way our ancestors uh, harvested uh, food that could apply to our life uh, today. First, let's take a look at the origin of food. What we believe is food came from the sky world, was brought down here by the sky woman as she uh, fell from uh, the world above. Some people say she grasped around the edge of the uh, hole that was made from the tree was uprooted and had uh, roots and seeds planted in her hands. Others say that she was given these foods by this sky panther. You can barely see him on the uh, picture on the, on the left. He's racing up to save her. He gave her foods, firewood, a little uh, corn pounder, and a ceramic pot. And he said, this is all you need to be able to survive in the new world. Another story tells us, though, when the sky woman had a daughter, when her daughter was born, gave birth to the creator and his brother, Flint, she died upon giving birth to the second child. And when they planted her body in a mound, corn, beans, squash, as well as tobacco and strawberry plants uh, grew from her body. Some people say there's also blue potatoes grew from her feet. So in her death, she gave a gift back to the world and back to the humans who were about to be created. And that was the foods that would sustain us. They say when the creator made humans, he gave them some instructions. He said, there's a path laid out in front of you. If you follow that path, Tell me what you see along the way. So the first man and first woman went down that path. They came to a big hole in the ground. Next to the hole was this mound. And out of that mound grew those plants. I think they were really looking back at the grave of the sky woman's daughter. And the creator told them that our sustainers grow there, grows out of this mound, grows out of the earth. We're supposed to share them with each other. And he told us not to waste the crops, not to waste the plants, not to waste what nature provides. He said the women will first take the corn and then the bean plant and the men will take the squash and they'll plant them thereby <clears throat> they were given an understanding of the meaning of the grave. In other words, we are born into this world, we're all going to pass away, but along the way, the way we sustain ourselves is through planting and cultivating foods. We have this tradition then of the three sisters. Actually, the word johiko means those that sustain us. It really includes all of the, all the food plants. But in this painting by Ernie Smith done back in the 1930s, we see the spirit of these three plants, corn, beans, and squash. They're like three sisters who guard over the fields. And they help one another. In reality, we've learned that uh, the beans that grow up the corn stalk nourish the corn, provide nitrogen for the soil that the corn needs. The squash with its broad leaves keeps the mound moist, allowing the weeds not to grow very well. So anyways, these three sisters work together just as we're supposed to work together in life. When the world was new, however, there was a competition between the creator and his brother Flint. The sky woman, the grandmother of them, sided with Flint for some reason. Flint wanted to destroy everything good in the world. When it came down to in the end, as the creator had to play a game against his grandmother to see who's going to win the seeds of life. He took this bowl, and inside the bowl were these uh, pits. They're light on one side, dark on the other, and they shook that bowl. And it depends on how those pits turned up, what color turned up, you would win these seeds. They say all of the animals and the birds came together to join in with this game. And in fact, the creator, what he did is he asked the chickadee, to lend their heads, which are light on one side and dark on the other. So every time he shook the bowl, of course, they turned up magically in his favor. So he defeated his grandmother, and, and then losing his grandmother said, now I understand what you're trying to do, that it's a good thing that we need to get ready because humans are about to enter this world. So creation's plan provides us with many ideas about how to live well on this great turtle island. And the people must learn to care for themselves as they grow up means we have to learn how to, how to be able to feed ourselves. And planting, cultivating, harvesting, and preparing crops, it will be hard work. You have to break out a sweat to do it. But if people use their good mind, they will see a great harvest to be able to feed their family. Of course, we also learn planting depends on the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the rains, the thunders. Everything that's part of creation comes into play in order to have a bountiful harvest. And the three sisters provide, are provided to sustain the people. They have a spiritual essence that nourishes us. So let's think of the traditional foods is almost like spirit food. It, it renews your body, it strengthens your body. It's a very important gift from creation. Our original instructions also told us then to follow an annual cycle of ceremonies for giving thanks for everything that nature provides. Some foods are ripen naturally, a lot of medicine plants ripen naturally, and then as we hunt and fish and trap uh, throughout the seasons, we're able to continue to nourish ourselves. This graphic was made to show the seasonal cycle of ceremonies. We're meant to eat seasonally. Certain foods become ripe in different parts, different times of the year, and we're able to provide a whole diet by eating seasonally. So and right now is fall time. Our men are out hunting. There's also fish are running. Certain medicines are 
strong right now, this time of year, so you get ready to enter into winter. Right now, as we collect our harvest, think about that. In the old days, you had to plan so far ahead to be able to plant enough food to get you through the harsh winter, be able to last all year long. This is why the ceremonies are important, because it's not just our physical activity that brings about a good harvest or healthy way of life. We also have to depend on our spiritual power, spiritual unity, with all the aspects of creation. Midwinter usually begins with what they call the big heads going around house to house, and this painting, again done by Ernie Smith, or this photograph from Tonawanda, shows these big heads that are dressed up. At one time, they wore fur robes and carried corn pounders. Wrapped around their neck and their ankles and their uh, waist were a band of corn husks. So they symbolize both the hunt and the harvest. They go by to the house to stir the ashes to renew the spirit of the fire and cut to start the new year again. We can see in the photograph, they stopped wearing fur robes and began to dress themselves in these blankets. And they're wearing these corn pounders to symbolize the fertility of the earth. So we store away our foods in anticipation of winter, and winter comes along, and it's the spirit of winter is like this icy old man. He lives in an icy lodge, and even though he has a fire, there's no heat that comes from it. If he had his way, it would be ice everywhere, forever. So we have to call upon the spirits of the earth uh, to help us out, and they send along this young man, well, the spirit of spring. Of course, he's a tall, dark, handsome stranger, uh, very muscular, as we can see in these paintings by Ernie Smith. He chases around that old man winter and eventually throws a jar of berry juice on him. So it looks like blood. That begins to melt this old man. Because if he didn't, the old man winter would go around and be hitting the trees, hitting the ice. You hear the, you hear the woods crack like that when you're in the woods in the wintertime because he's trying to destroy everything. So the spirit of spring comes back, gives us some hope that the earth will renew itself. It's another painting by Ernie Smith that shows the blessing of the field before the planting began. Usually the family would gather out there, and a young woman, what we called under the husk, a woman just before reaching puberty, would bless the field, and they would sing their songs. They would sing their songs about getting ready to plant. It's a way in which the family had a relationship with the field even before the crops were planted. It was all done to notify both the earth and the seeds and all of the other things that come into play that were about ready to plant again. We have this great philosophy of dish with one spoon. It says that nature provides everything that we need to be happy and healthy. Think of it, a dish full of uh, all of the animals, the plants, the birds, the medicine plants, the crops, the waters. It's like nature's prescription for a whole health plan. So here it is. And inside of that, we're supposed to take from what we need in order to be happy and healthy. We only take to what we need to feed our families or to heal ourselves. We always leave something in a dish for others. So even when we planted a field, we always planted some extra corn, some extra food for all of the animals and birds that also depend on us. This is a photograph of the wampum belt called the dish with one spoon. You can see that dark figure represents the dish. Inside that dish is a beaver tail, that, that white rectangle. Beaver tail is supposed to be one of our most nutritious meals that we can have. And it talks then about how sharing this meal, we're not supposed to fight over what nature provides. We're supposed to share with one another. And this is the underlying philosophy that helps with our agricultural systems. It's altogether different to grow up in a garden, to grow up Haudenosaunee, uh, planting, uh, cultivating, harvesting, uh, preparing the foods, or doing the ceremonies. It's really a different way of life. We used to have mound agriculture. We'd clear a field, and we'd hill up these mounds of dirt to mimic what we saw at the time of the creation. And then we would have various ways of planting corn, beans, and squash together. Sometimes we would plant uh, Jerusalem artichokes between the mounds, or sometimes uh, other squash plants, or big flowering plants. But the gardens were huge. There was one village in central New York, it's called Ginondigan, and in 1687, they talk about over a million bushes of corn stored there. Imagine what it would take to organize the whole village, to do the planting and harvesting, and then to haul all of that corn from cornfields that were up to five miles away. It was a monster job. It was just amazing to me how much coordination it would take. You would never hear a kid say, I have nothing to do. When my father was young, they talked about how they harvested corn back then. They would tie the corn stalks together and pull them out of the ground and just leave them there, almost like a, like a corn-shaped teepee. And the, the corn would dry there on the stalk. And you see in this photograph here from Allegheny, you see pumpkins were planted between the corn stalks. So all uh, winter long, you would just go out there and pull off the corn that you need and take it back into your house to cook it. Our ancestors depended on agriculture up until when I was a kid. When my father was young, 90% of the people on the reserve were farming. 
Today, I'm sad to say, less than 10% are farming with any kind of regular basis. Corn is a great gift to our people. It's also endangered. As a result of genetically modified corn, the way corn is processed, white corn has been industrialized. Blue corn is also suffering the same kind of fate. So we have to be sure we preserve the integrity of our corn seeds. We have to make sure we're planting for the future and keeping those seeds uh, strong and healthy. Because right now, you can go to a natural food store and still get products that have been genetically modified or somehow industrialized, uh, sometimes even use uh, you know, radiation to kill whatever germs are in there. So you can never trust what comes from a bag, a box, or a can. You can only know what comes from your field because of the labor you put into it. So we had a lot of great traditions about agriculture, about planting and harvesting. Here's just some tools that were used to in order to peel back the husk on the corn when it was ripe. Because it can be arduous work, it's especially as the corn begins to dry out. You know, it'll cut your fingers if you're not careful. So we had a variety of tools that were used to peel that corn back. And we had many kinds of corn. It's hard to say exactly how many, but in the 19, early 1900s, they did a survey, and these were the corns that they identified at the time. There's a variety of types of corn, soft corns, used, you could say, for making bread, flint corns that are very hard. You need wood ashes to cook it in order to make a soup and cornbread. You also have uh, sweet corns, and we had uh, two, uh, a yellow corn and a black corn that were considered sweet corn. And then we also had what they call pod corn. You can basically see it's the smallest one on the lower right. Every kernel was covered with husk. So look at these corns. Do you know which type is which? Well, I just mentioned the pod corn. You can see it there on the right. And then there's a cross section of the seeds. This shows you how much flour or starch and sugar is involved in each seed. The dark areas show how hard the kernel is on the outside. So each different kind of corn has a different makeup to it. Our ancestors had to know this, know how to plant corn so it doesn't cross fertilize, and then also know how to prepare it. The one on the far left, that's popcorn. See how hard it is? That's why it pops, because it's, the outside is so dense. When you heat it up, that little sugary corn center pops open. You can see the one, the third from the left, it's called dent corn. You can see how the top drops down. That's because it has a lot of more sugar content in it. So we see the different styles of corn in this drawing here. It gives us some more detail about that. The popcorn there where the kernels are really tough and flinty. The flint corn, each kernel is encased in a hard uh, flinty coat, but it has a soft starchy substance in the center. And they go on and on. So learning the different uh, kinds of corn, and, and you can just literally cut a corn seed in half to tell what kind of corn it is, is important to know because you don't want to crossbreed these corns. You could have two different kinds of white corn, a flint corn and a soft flower corn. If you, if you plant them together, you're going to cross fertilize them and cause some trouble for them. This is the pod corn. Some people called it the grandfather corn. It actually probably should have been called the grandmother corn. They say that it's a Seneca brand where it grows very rarely. You would just take one of these seeds and plant it in your cornfield. helps to rejuvenate the whole field. So it's a, kind of like a form of corn medicine. It's very rare. They found one a long time ago under a um, man's bed at Tonawanda where the seed itself is about 50 years old. And they were able to uh, regerminate it and grow it again. So it's very rare. If you ever get to Make sure you share it, though, and help other people continue planting it, but put at least one in your garden because it'll help your corn stay strong. It takes plenty of corn knowledge in order to be Haudenosaunee. Not everybody could know everything. I'm sure certain clans specialize in certain kinds of corn. Maybe one village was uh, specialized in some kind, another one in a different kind, because you have to be careful, like I said, not to let corn cross-fertilize. Now, even today, you have to be extra careful because if you're planting near uh, other farmers who aren't as conscientious or using a different kind of seed, you could uh, ruin the quality of this heirloom corn. At the same time, you can also breed back its strength. You'll see some of them, they're kind of calico color or intermix. Uh, the corn comes out in many different ways. It doesn't always mean it's cross-fertilized. All of those colors are just about in every corn seed. So knowing how to select the proper seed for planting is an important part of indigenous knowledge. This chart shows the nutritional value of unprocessed white corn. You can see that it's very high in some of these essential vitamins. But when you cook it, it changes. We use wood ashes on the white corn in order to soften the outside shell. But those wood ashes also transform the corn and we get a big boost in certain nutrients. Knocking the kernels off the corn cob can be a very difficult job. It also wears on your fingers. So our ancestors used the jawbone of a horse, as we see below, or a cow, 
worry white-tailed deer. And by using the teeth in particular, you could scrape those uh, hard kernels off the corn cobs, as we see in this photograph here. And cooking corn, there's many ways to cook it. There's many kind of recipes. We kind of get stuck in our community today just looking at uh, corn soup and corn bread. But our ancestors had a hundred different kinds of recipes for corn. One thing, though, about white corn, when it dries, it becomes very hard. You're able to store it a long time, sometimes up to several years. And if we look at the corn, because it becomes so hard, we have to find a way to crack that uh, outside shell in order to be able to cook it. So for white corn, we use hardwood ashes that create this alkaline solution. And that's when we soak the seeds in it, they begin to, it begins to loosen the outer hulls. The women usually use a corn washing basket to rinse off their corn. In this slide here, we see what the corn looks like when you put the ashes in it. It turns this bright yellow-orange color. And then you have to keep boiling it and boiling it <clears throat> to get it uh, to the right stage. And the outside uh, hulls will loosen. Those black eyes will loosen on the corn, and it'll begin to puff up like we see here. This chart then shows how it changes when using these wood ashes. Then all of a sudden, we get a high dose of calcium. You hear today that, you know, we can only get calcium from uh, milk. Well, in the old days, this is where they got their calcium from. It reduces some of the other nutritional aspects, but we get a lot of calcium, niacin, uh, from this uh, cooked corn. And corn has to be pounded. We pound it dry and crack it up or uh, cook it a little bit and then uh, pound it up. The corn pounder was in use by Native people all throughout the Northeast, Well, wherever they planted corn. They usually two people pounded corn. And you let the high, heavy weight of the corn pounder do the work for you. You don't have to be smashing it, but you let it with a, with a certain rhythm. When I was young, you could hear the women in the community pounding corn. It created a certain kind of rhythm that you knew somebody was making corn soup or cornbread. This list gives us an idea of the kinds of corn foods that were made. Now, this is in the Seneca language, but there's a wide variety of things. And maybe we should find ways to explore the making of these uh, meals again. So we see we have corn pudding, boiled cornbread. That's the one we're more familiar with. There's hominy corn. It's a little different than the others. We have nut and corn porridge, or dried corn soup, many, many different kinds. And I'm sure there's even more than on our list here. But that would also be important because you can't be eating the same foods all the time. They had so many ways of cooking corn beans and squash that it was always interesting to see what meal was going to be placed in front of you. And the making of cornbread, although it continues today all across the territory of the Haudenosaunee, is an important process in itself. And the corn's kind of amazing when you cook, when you make these, uh, these loaves of corn and then you boil it. Now, generally put in kidney beans, but there's actually better beans to use. There is a cornbread bean. There's all kinds of different beans that are tastier. Some people also would use nuts, like uh, butternuts inside, or berries. And when you boil the corn in a big vat, all of a sudden it rises up to the top. Then you know that it's done. Now, we have a tendency to put corn syrup and bread on it, but in the old days, the corn itself was pretty tasty. We can see there are even more different types of corn food used, everything from roasted hominy corn to, to popcorn pudding. Another interesting use of uh, corn was to make these uh, wedding bread. Inside the corn husk would be a corn meal, much like a, a corn bread, tied in the middle. And when a uh, young man was interested in uh, marrying a woman, he, his family would prepare a basket full of this uh, corn bread uh, wrapped up in corn leaves, take it to the house of the woman that he's interested in. If his family accepted it and they sent back a... Uh, a basket full of cornbread, that meant that the marriage was likely to continue. So the bread was important because it not only represented our our inheritance from the past, it can represent our future. They say, you know, up in the sky world, there was an old man who was uh, suffering from a kind of a mental disorder, emotional disorder, and there was a young woman who was having a tough time grieving. When they finally met, she gave the old man boiled cornbread with berries in it, and it uplifted his mind. He, in turn, gave her some venison, roasted venison, and that uplifted her mind. And that exchange between the meat and the corn was symbolic than our relationship, and that's represented here in this wedding bread. In addition to corn, we have many different kinds of beans, probably almost 60 different kinds. Unfortunately, we're losing our, a lot of our language around these beans, a lot of uh, information uh, about them. Not everybody's planting a wide variety of beans that we can have, so that's one thing we're trying to do, is to restore the diversity of our heirloom seeds. And then finally, we have a wide variety of squashes and melons, about seven different kinds. Everything from, uh, you know, watermelons and summer and winter squash uh, to musk melons and even cucumbers. All of these were an important part of the Aboriginal diet that our ancestors ate. There's also a Three Sisters Wampum. It talks about at one time, there were these three sisters who started arguing all the time. 
In fact, they argued so much they could barely stand to be in each other's presence. Well, an old woman said, this is very disruptive for our whole community. She went and made this wampum string that we see here with these double strands uh, hanging down at the bottom. She invited all of these three women over to her lodge one time, but didn't tell each other that they were all coming. So when they all showed up, naturally they, they didn't want to stay because they were so upset with each other. But she said, wait a minute, let's go back around the longhouse. Let's go take a look at the garden. So they walked around there and they looked and she pointed out to them. She says, look at what's growing in the garden. What do you see? They all mentioned, well, we see corn, beans, and squash. And she said, yes, it's like three sisters. They're growing together. They help one another. And we need you to be that way. We need to be a reflection of what our garden looks like because our garden will be a reflection of us. If you keep arguing, the garden won't grow very well. So somehow she was able to convince these girls to put aside their animosity and try to live together. But she gave them that wampum string and says, we're going to put this together. Every time you guys start arguing, we're going to remove some of those beads. If you keep arguing, there'll be no beads left. There'll be no hope left. So please, try to be careful. And I think this is also why we have this tradition of when you go to the garden, you're supposed to have a good mind. You're not supposed to argue. You're not supposed to use harsh words. You have to have good thoughts because the three sisters, the spiritual essence of those plants, depends on our emotional stability in order for them to grow well. But in addition to cultivated foods, we also gathered many of our foods. It's amazing to me how much is there in nature if we would just take the time to go and harvest it. This painting by Ernie Smith shows this oyster mushroom. It's really important because it contains the kind of materials that you need in order to control your cholesterol. And today, cholesterol is a big uh, big matter, big health matter. And to think this oyster mushroom just grows naturally, usually on a tree that's fallen over or in a woods that's a little moist. You just go and pick it and prepare it. You can dry it out and use it in salads and soups. We're probably all familiar with wild strawberries. Many of our people continue to pick them. They're just one of the many fruits that uh, ripen. It's both a food and a medicine, as uh, with all of the foods. They have medicinal qualities, they have the spiritual essence. But because the strawberry plant grows closest to the ground, it's the first fruit to ripen in the spring, we give a special ceremony to give thanks for it. Our ancestors also harvested wild artichokes. It kind of looks like a sunflower. It's a big, tall plant. Uh, but it produces a root that's kind of like a potato, only it's more nutritious for you. It won't give you the same kind of uh, problems that modern-day potatoes give you. Particularly if you're uh, diabetic, this is a great alternative to potatoes. So the wild artichoke, or some people call it Jerusalem artichoke, as it, uh, it's kind of wandering around in the field. It'll take over your field if you're not careful, and it produces a small, gnarled root, but is very tasty. Wild plums are also important to our ancestors. They would pick them and dry them out, dry them in the sun, and it became like a really large raisin, and then they would add it to foods, whether it's a salad or soup or stew that you're making later. And a lot of these plums are still growing in the community, but we don't pick them. And it's funny about fruit like this. If you don't pick it, it begins to diminish. And the more you pick it, the kind of more bountiful it is. So we pay attention to that. Next time you're walking in the field, you're going to be able to see more and more wild plants growing all the time. Our ancestors found essential oils in a lot of the uh, wild nuts that uh, fell from the trees. In this picture, we see women boiling <coughs> hickory nuts. And when you boil the nuts, the oil comes up to the top, and they're able to skim that off and use that both as a medicine as well as uh, to help nourish other foods. The shagbark hickory is the tree that we use to make lacrosse sticks, but it produces actually a quite tasty nut itself. Many of them just go to waste on the ground. A lot of people don't realize what they are, but we should start turning to that because you, it provides an oil, an essential oil, that you can't get from any other product. The same with sunflower oil. You, you can buy it in a supermarket, but when you're growing it yourself, it takes a lot of work and a lot of sunflowers to be able to harvest those little tiny seeds, chop them up, boil them up, in order to get this very rich oil. Sunflower oil and other nut oils were used to help flavor all of the meals that our ancestors prepared. In 1779, the American soldiers uh, were burning down the villages of the Senecas and Acugas in central New York. And they came across this one fruit that they wrote about. We came across what they call Indian apples. They grow on a small bush, only one stalk, which is about two feet high. Six inches from the bottom, there's one branch. And on this branch, there's a very large leaf. And in the crotch of these grows the apple about as big as a walnut shell. And all over it has a thick skin like lemons. And the middle of it tasted very fine. What fruit do you think that is? Well, it turns out it's called a pawpaw. And as we can see here, it was actually the largest fruit in indigenous to North America. And the Senecas used it. I'm sure other people across the land of the Haudenosaunee would eat this. And we can see it's a yellowish flesh on the inside. Very few people eat this today or would even grow that, but it's something that maybe we might want to return to. 
There's a big movement in our community across the territory of the Haudenosaunee, I dare say across the indigenous people of North America, to decolonize our diet, to get rid of those things that are causing our bodies harm and causing the increase in diseases among our people, and to return to the heritage that we have of planting, particularly in our case, the gift of corn, beans, and squash. You know, diabetes was relatively unknown among our people prior to 1940. Now it's become one of the most significant killers. We're even seeing it now in our young people. It all goes back to the kind of food that we eat. So it only makes sense. This life plan that the Creator laid out for us when the world was first made, these spirit foods that we were given, and instructions about how to prepare them, this was made so that we would live a long, happy and healthy life. Maybe it's time we put more attention to the agricultural heritage we have. Our ancestors lived quite well without a tractor, without a plow, without irrigation, without a grocery store, even without a refrigerator. It took a lot of physical labor, a lot of indigenous knowledge, and a lot of spiritual belief that what was provided for us in the beginning of the world will sustain us for many generations to come.